The Inimitables Phil. Phil Sturgeon. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. All right, hello everyone. Um, excuse me, with a, I have a cough drop in my mouth because my voice is ruined. Um, <laughs> which makes understanding my terrible English much harder, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, I, my name's Phil Sturgeon. Um, I used to work at a company that shall not be named, but they're a fancy, expensive co-working space. Um, and um, I, I hated it, so I left to go cycle around the world. Um, interestingly, that we don't have any color right now. Uh, I don't know. Wait for it. Fantastic. Um, anyone know any jokes? Uh, no, so I, I, I left to go cycle around the world. Um, and uh, I cycled here because I'm trying to reduce my carbon footprint. If we don't all reduce our carbon footprint to about a quarter of what it is right now, we're going to die in a climate apocalypse. But let's not dwell on that. Um, through 2017 and 2018, um, I had a lot of questions. And, and last year here, I gave a talk. Um, trying to kind of figure some of this stuff out. <laughs> Who needs slides? So the first question um, I was trying to figure out was design first or code first, right? Like while I was working at this large co-working space, there were a lot of different API developers all trying to kind of figure out when to do open API and how and with what and what order and um, should we use open API two or three? Should we, um, um, why are there no visual editors, right? Like, why do we have to write all this YAML by hand? That sounds annoying. Um, how and when do we create documentation from that? But how do we create mocks uh, and other things? Um, and the most important question is, when you've done all of this work, how do you then keep the code and the, um, and the docs in sync, right? Like, put your hands up if this is a problem for you. Yeah, everyone, right? Like, everyone. It's solved. I got it. Got the answer. Um, so. Uh, firstly, which tooling supports OpenAPI 3? Basically, all of it. Well, most of it. <laughs> um, if you go to openapi.tools, then uh, there is a whole list of stuff. And on the right there, it will say, you know, version 2 support, meh, version 3. Most things actually support version 3. Um, more things support v3 than v2 now, so we're in a pretty good state. So that's easy. Solved. Design first or code first? Solved. Um, this sucks. <laughs> uh, basically, if you're doing code first, a lot of the time what you end up doing is writing a whole bunch of code and then like littering your code with a bunch of nonsense. Um, and in a language that supports annotations as a first class citizen, it's not quite so bad. Um, like this isn't the worst thing, but this really is the worst. <laughs> um, in, in PHP, basically, you just kind of write a whole bunch of doc blocks, a bunch of comments near your code. Um, and the argument for why this is good is, well, if the document, if the um, if the annotations uh, are close to the code, then people will probably update it when they change the code. People have used that argument, and that, that's a big probably, right? Um, just being nearby doesn't make it true. Um, code uh, annotations generally fill, um, oh, yeah, code comments are facts waiting to become lies. Um, a visualization, if you're more of a visually minded person, is this. It's not milk. So, boring slide, I apologize, but basically, um, this is kind of what everyone was doing. Uh, 2012, everyone was doing code first, then docs when we have time, in quotation marks. Um, because what happens is you end up planning it, you write it on the back of a napkin or you whatever. Um, you share that napkin with the developer who's using your API. Um, you write a bunch of code and get some feedback and write a bunch more code and get some feedback. And it's a very expensive feedback loop because you're writing a bunch of code. Um, then once the customer is either bored of giving you feedback or the deadlines come up, you just deploy whatever it is you're doing. Um, then you say, great, we, we've had our post-launch party, everything's in production, seems to be working, um, and then we'll do the doc some other time. And that other time never comes up because you start getting um, new customers and new feedback and everything else. And so you're busy working on the actual deployed uh, product. You find a bunch of you know, uh, performance bottlenecks you didn't think about. And you you've just work really hard on, on maintaining the API. And by the time somebody actually needs the documentation, what generally happens is everyone's forgotten how most of the API works. Um, this happened at the co-working space very often. Um, where somebody would come along, they honestly, the developers wouldn't remember how the API worked, so they just build a new version of the API. So you have v1, v2, v3, v4, v5. v1 was the iPhone app, v2 was the web app, v3 was the mobile, you know, and it just was nonsense. And that's, again, very expensive because you're using developers' time to rebuild an API that you didn't need to rebuild. You could have just, you know, used it with documentation. 
Um, so you end up building a new API and the feedback loop begins once again. So this sucks, don't do this. Most of you are also probably doing this. Um, the next step is that you generate docs. Uh, so again, that's usually annotations. Um, it's, it's a similar feedback cycle where you write a bunch of code and you share the napkin around in the same kind of process. Um, you share the docs, you get feedback, you deploy, um, you deploy the docs and the code together, and because the docs come from the code, then it's a slightly smaller feedback loop. Um, but when people realize that design first, uh, when people realize that code first kind of sucks and they try and work on design first, this is generally where people get. It's this kind of nice feedback loop at the start where you kind of design it with OpenAPI, no more napkin driven development. Um, you share the mocks and the docs to get feedback before um, you actually write the code so that your customer feedback is based on just kind of the, the, the mocks and the docs, which is just a representation of the YAML. So if they have feedback, you can very easily tweak that YAML in seconds and change a lot of stuff without having to rename all your controllers and everything else. Um, but the problem is, the design first then ditch for code has been evangelized a lot recently. Um, a lot of people are, are recommending this. And the problem is it assumes that there's a time where you're done designing and then you don't need to design anymore. Um, this is really common, uh, things like you know, import into Postman and then therefore no more open API, you just do Postman now. Or um, import into Kong and then you just have, that's your live thing now. Um, and it means that the, you get this divergence between uh, the actual kind of docs or the, the API description documents. Um, they diverge from what the code is actually doing, so you have this really hard time trying to keep the two things in sync because now you have two sources of truth. So this is the one I'm trying to evangelize, the design first and then evolve with code. Um, again, no more napkin-driven napkin development. You get a very quick feedback loop before you start writing any code. Um, but then you actually use the open API to simplify the code that you're writing and actually that stuff goes into production and it goes into your test suite and it goes everywhere so that everything stays in sync and it means that when someone requests new functionality, you already know that your design files are completely up to date um, and, and like true and accurate so you can actually design the new endpoint or the new resource or whatever um, straight from it. So it's a bit complicated, really like API life cycles are huge and there's loads of different feedback cycles and you know, deployments and working on things, and then someone talks about money and you change stuff, but um, this is how it ended up looking at WeWork. Uh, damn it, I said WeWork. <laughs> My lawyer's gonna be upset. Um, so, uh, this, is, uh, this is the talk I gave last year, this, this workflow, right? Super complicated, it's really hard to see things. Basically, you have the development cycle, you write open API. This little legend is basically saying green is sorted, yellow is kind of rubbish, um, orange we're working on, and red we haven't figured out yet. Um, and it was really hard to get this entire life cycle. You've got mock servers and, and you've got uh, a reference documentation and end-to-end -end testing and Postman, we'd sync to that because people loved using that as a HTTP client. Um, and SDK generation, loads and loads of stuff. I was trying to figure all of this out, but I was hacking it all together with duct tape and string and it was powered by hamsters and it was terrible. Um, mostly because a lot of the tooling vendors that existed at the time, uh, there were walled gardens and some of them would offer you part of it but they'd trap you in their walled garden and they wouldn't offer the rest. So you had these like multiple different places where you're paying lots and lots of money for some of the functionality that you needed. Um, so Stoplight was the closest to being useful, but they, the, the, the version that existed last year when giving the talk was no good for me for a series of reasons. Um, the studio, we wanted to use OpenAPI 3 and they had a product which only supported V2 at the time and it meant that the very first step in the cycle, the actual writing of OpenAPI was kind of crappy. It was people hacking stuff with YAML by hand. Um, and when you're trying to sell somebody on an entire life cycle when step one sucks, you're not going to get very far. Uh, this sentiment says it pretty well. Um, basically. It sucks writing lots of YAML by hand, <laughs> is the short version. Uh, so that brings me on to one of the six questions I was asking last year, which is why are there no visual editors? Eventually I ended up giving Stoplight so much feedback, they just said it would make more sense if you worked here, so now I do. <laughs> um, Stoplight Studio solves it, visual editor, um, covers 60% of the keywords with pretty little buttons. Um, we're working on making that better, but you can always use text mode for advanced stuff. It has dark mode, which is incredibly important. Um, and one of the main things about the new studio is that it, it, you can use it on the web uh, as a SaaS, but they also have a local uh, 
they, we have a, um, a local application for Windows and Linux and, uh, and Mac, and you can work with local files. There's no more trapping you in a walled garden. It's totally free. By the way, every time I mention the stoplight thing today, it's totally free. I'm not here selling you anything. It just solves all of the problems I had. Um, so you can work with local files, YAML, uh, JSON schema, OpenAPI v2 and v3. Um, and it's not a simplistic thing. Like it, it, it makes a lot of very hard things uh, very easy. You can have all of and one of and any of and all the refs and uh, you can reference things in the current file or different files or URLs or a shared component library, right? You can share them across multiple APIs, even across your entire organization. So it's pretty bonkers the stuff it can do. And you can mix in markdown files as well, which is cool. So that solved the visual part. How do we create mocks? Uh, they solved it again. Uh, so Prism is a command line tool, but it's also built into Studio. Um, and we have a hosted version coming out soon. Get on with it. Um, how and when do we create documentation? Again, solved. Um, the, if you go to docs, it's totally free. There's a fancy paid version where you can have custom URLs and white labeling and everything else, but don't worry about that. And it looks pretty. It's really good. You can just click publish, and then it's published. So with all of those problems solved, right, like those problems totally solved, I was at a conference, uh, API the Docs, and there were loads of people on stage talking about like how do we do all these things, and they came up with these crazy complicated zany solutions, like even companies as big as Salesforce are just like hacking shit together, which all of us were doing, um, and they call it uh, Doc Ops, right, and it's nice to just, all of that solved, you can just use this shit for free, and it's fine. Um, so the main question we have left is like, okay, fantastic, you've solved this life cycle, you've solved the, the tooling, you've solved all these problems. Um, how do you keep that stuff in sync? That problem still sounds like it exists, right? And there was an image which was fantastic, and I don't know what it was. Um, but basically, uh, when you're trying to think about how to keep documentation in sync with code, don't think about documentation, think about API descriptions, right? So the real question is how to use descriptions as code. Not code generation, that's a whole other thing. Basically what you have is this situation where you have two sources of truth. You have the API and the reference documentation that both have a lot of really similar information. Um, so where do you put uh, server validation? Model, controller, are you an animal and you put it in the view? Maybe it goes in the service or you create a new concept called contracts, right? Those contracts, any Ruby fans? Barely fits on the screen. Um, Regex, fantastic. Uh, you end up writing these things which say this field has these properties and it looks a lot like something else. Um, in JavaScript, this actually doesn't look that bad, but that's because the other examples wouldn't fit on the screen. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, again, not great having to write all this stuff because you're basically duplicating what you've already written in your open API, right? What's the point in writing this stuff twice? Um, the main problem isn't that, oh no, I have to write this thing out again. It's more that when you have two sources of truth, you actually have to constantly check for lies. Um, so Dread is a tool that exists and it is very hard to get running. In my personal experience, you spend ages kind of seeding the perfect data for it to run through the test suite and then eventually it breaks and teams just turn it off. So. Um, what I like to use is reuse API descriptions for actual server-side validation. You just do this. That's it. <laughs> In your code. Um, if you have, this is a rack example, but any middleware based system, you register a middleware and then it will just validate your incoming requests, right? Um, so there's, it's in every language, everything has this. Even Java and whatever Mojo Licious is. So once you've enabled one of those middlewares, uh, any requests that come in with nonsense, they're missing a parameter or whatever, it's the wrong type, it will just give you an error. And if you're using RFC 7807, then it will give you a fancy error that looks like this. So now what you've done is your API and your documentation are both referencing the same description document and therefore it's, it is the docs are correct because they're just a HTML rendering of the actual logic. What that means is if you already have validation logic, you can delete it. Um, and if you are building a, building a new application, you don't need to bother writing it in the first place. So that's a win-win. People always think, ah, oh, Phil, I've caught you out. I've thought of a flaw in your plan. Um, things like, you know, is this email unique can never be uh, figured out with a simple contract. Yep, that's fine. It means you deleted 90% of your validation code and you have to write a little bit yourself. And if you're omitting those errors with the same format, no one knows whether it came from the, the uh, open API or from your code. 
So basically now what you're doing is all of your requests are validated um, to be correct with your test suite. Your existing test suite is proving that your request documentation is correct, right? There's no need for something like Dread to try and see if the requests are correct. And then your test suite um, is also, uh, you can assert responses. So when your, uh, when your test suite gives you a response, you can look at the actual JSON that came back and then you can run an assertion library to say, is this correct? Any data validator will do it. In uh, our spec, it looks a bit like this. There's a whole blog post um, on APOs you won't hate, uh, written by some annoying British guy. And it looks a little bit like this. Um, you just basically do your existing test suite, and then you have a single assertion that says, does it match the user schema? So that user is user uh, schemas slash users.json. And you just say, does it match the schema? Done. So you can do even more. Um, Running this middleware, some people say like, oh, that sounds slow, it's another flaw in your plan. Um, but you can do this at the gateway too. Um, most of them, basically the concept is kind of like HTTP caching, uh, where like you don't bother your application server for repeated requests. Um, gateway validation means that you don't bother your application server with invalid requests, right? So if someone sends you nonsense, why waste time telling them it's nonsense? Um, they can just post you something and then the gateway says, dash, shove off, come back when you've got an email in a valid format. Um, and then the API server can focus on like handling payments instead of nonsense. A bunch of different gateways do this, including Express Gateway. There you go. Um, and uh, Tyke, talk to them downstairs. They handle JSON schema. Uh, and so people say, well, that sounds a bit hard. That's another flaw in your plan, Phil. I've thought about it. What you can do is you can register a middleware in your development environment, um, and you can uh, use the gateway plugin in production and any combination for, for QA and, and staging. So theoretically, if the tools are all standards compliant, then you will have dev prod parity. If they're not standards compliant, then send them a pull request. That might be a flaw. So there's one last thing we're going to smash through rather quickly, which is client validation. Anyone ever thought about this? Um, quite often, people will develop break. Uh, people will make changes to an API that they consider to not be a breaking change. For example, right, we've got a mobile app, a web app, and an API, and all of them know that the maximum length is 20. They looked at the documentation, which is perfectly correct and up to date, thanks to all of our earlier work, and they've said, right, we know that we can't have anything longer than 20. So they plug that into the input forms, and um, they write that. And the reason the clients will bake in and like copy and paste the validation logic is they want to have like much quicker real-time inputs. They want to show tool tips and feedback, right? So they don't want to run to the server and say, is this correct every time? So they end up copying and pasting all the logic. Somebody comes along and says, actually, uh, Germans exist, so we need a longer name field. Um, and so, uh, basically, this is fine, right? Because you've just increased the length, that's not breaking, until somebody comes along and uh, changes one of the clients. What happens here is that somebody, um, a German says, thank you very much, I can fit my name in here now. And they do that on the web app. But when they go, and that goes into the API, and that's fine, when they go to the mobile application, all of a sudden, um, their name is either truncated, or they try to submit that existing name after changing some other field, and it says that it's invalid, because the validation is now out of sync across different places. So what you can do is use JSON schema at runtime. Uh, all you have to do is omit the link to the, um, to the schema uh, and use the describe by rel. Um, and it looks a little bit like this. So uh, at the top there, cached schema, pretend you downloaded that from the internet. We've got a little validate function using AJV, and it says run it, and if there's a problem, spit out some errors. So we've got some fake input here, which we're gonna pretend came from a form, um, and then we run it, and it's correct, right? That's a valid age, that's a valid email address, fantastic. If we change it uh, to email123, then we get an error saying the email field is wrong, that should be a string. And what you can do with this error output you can um, actually, with a few lines of code, this is not hard, and I've got a blog post that shows you how you do it, you can create these uh, human readable messages. Now, yes, this is in English, you can run it through internationalization logic, but um, basically, a couple of lines of code, I have a really nice bit of validation logic, which I didn't have to build specifically, I just look. If it complains about the format, then you can input the actual format from the schema and show people how to do it. And so now you have this. Everything is in sync. There's one source of truth. Your description documents are the source of truth. Your API operates off of that. Your reference documentation shows people what that is. Um, your web app and your mobile app and every other client are all using the exact same thing. And theoretically, everything's perfect. And none of it costs you any money.
Um, so we have this wonderful feedback loop that we talked about at the start. And uh, because you've been using your stuff in production, when somebody requests new functionality, you know for a fact that it's up to date. So you can very easily create a new endpoint, model everything, and that's fine. And I think I nailed that for time. So we have time for questions. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Or is it just perfectly clear? <laughs> All right, fantastic. Well, <laughs> Yeah, so variable payloads and things, right? Like if you have a payload which is, um, if you're a Java developer, you probably don't do this, but if, if you have a payload that's like, this can be a string or an object for some reason, or like if A exists, then you have to send B and C and D and whatever else. Um, all these kind of quirky payloads, which a lot of uh, PHP and Java uh, developers do. Um, it's currently quite hard to do in OpenAPI 3.0, but 3.1 will hopefully upgrade to full-on latest JSON schema as soon as the pull request is merged. Um, and once that's done, you can use JSON schema for super variable stuff. They have if, then, else, which somebody said, like, ah, now it's Tor incomplete. Um, but if, then, else is quite simple. You just say, like, if this schema is true, um, then, you know, apply some other keywords to it and you add more validation. Um, and so JSON schema is perfectly capable of handling the if, then, else stuff. Um, but until OpenAPI upgrades to the latest JSON schema, that doesn't, doesn't work, um, which will hopefully happen soon. <laughs> yes? Same thing with uh, async API, they, they were arguing the same. Um, and the reason they were not doing it and they were not convinced is because they had to write the JSON schema definition for the contract, let's say, or for the description, mm. and also the model in Java or in, or in Kotlin, yeah. and keep them in sync. You know? yes. And I'm not keep them in sync, like you just described, to keep them in sync, uh, Dread is, is, is nice. Um, but this is a double work, you know, like you're describing sure. the same thing twice. And yeah, so at least. Sure. It can be very hard to convince people, basically developers who are used to writing the code, the code being the most important thing, they are then being taught that they should document their code, and then they're being taught that there's more uses than just documentation, right? So when people think that API descriptions are just docs, um, it's very hard to convince them to change all of their code, because they're used to their code being the most important thing. Like, I'm a developer, I like to develop, I don't like planning, that sounds boring. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so basically when developers are used to uh, code being the one true source of truth, um, they, they don't like changing that and it's a very hard sell. Um, but once developers realize they can get away with writing less code, they, they often will end up switching. Like it's, it's a hard sell, but like if, you know, a few experiments go through the company and then they realize, oh, this solves a lot of my problems. Um, and so like code generation scares the crap out of people, but I'm not talking about code generation, right? You can use like runtime evaluation and they're like, wait, I don't even need to write models or my model can be a very lightweight ORM layer, which doesn't have to worry about all the validations or just references this other thing for validations. Um, so yeah, you, you'll always have some holdout that are like, I'm going to maintain my description docs and my code completely separately. And when their API is constantly broken because clients don't know how to work with it properly, they will probably stop doing that. And if they do, that's on, that's on them, right? <laughs> and that is time. Thank you very much.